Imagine if there were a set of study techniques so powerful that they could transform anybody into a top A-grade student. Well, there are, they're based on scientific evidence, and according to this paper from Nature, they're some of the most robust findings in the psychology of learning. So what are these techniques? Well, that's what I'm going to share with you in this video. Four study strategies that are scientifically proven to transform your learning ability. Once you know how to use them, you'll be able to become a top student in any subject you want. But first, science has also shown that there are two widely used study strategies that you must avoid because they're holding you back. The first is highlighting, the second rereading. Think about it. How many times have you read a page in a book only to realize you didn't absorb anything? Or have you ever spent hours highlighting only to forget everything later? You're not alone. Let's explore why this happens. Rereading a text and highlighting creates a familiarity, a fluency with the learning materials, giving the illusion of learning. Because you get to know the materials so well, you develop a false sense of mastery. You are fooled into believing that your knowledge of the words in the text is a sign of your understanding of the concepts. But it's not. It's superficial. I remember my university days, highlighting nearly every line in my textbooks, thinking I was preparing for my exams. Only later did I realize that I was just coloring the pages. Now let's dive into methods that actually work. Retrieval practice. In 1917, a handful of children in grades 3, 5, 6 and 8 were told to study short biographies from who's who in America. They were split into groups. Some were directed to just read, others to spend varying amounts of time pausing from the text, looking up and reciting to themselves what they'd read. Then they were tested. Every group that used recitation retained more information than the ones that just read. The best results were from those who spent 60% of their study time in recitation. This result has been repeated in hundreds of experiments since then and is one of the most robust findings in the psychology of learning. What does it mean for you? Testing isn't just a way of assessing what you know. It's an uncommonly effective learning strategy. Our brains learn better when we try to retrieve information than when we try to deposit it. So as you're reading a text, test yourself. If you feel you should reread the text, test yourself instead. It doesn't matter how, free recall, multiple choice, short answer, true, false quizzes or tests, or flashcards. In fact, and this seems astonishing, studies show that retrieval practice helps on a subject about which you know nothing. Yes, dear viewer, if I ask you some questions on, let's say, aeronautical engineering, and I'm assuming you're not an aeronautical engineer, if you are, please let me know in the comments, just attempting to answer them somehow preps your brain to receive that information and that helps you learn it better. It's like magic. Is there a downside? Mm, not really. The slight downside is that this requires more effort than just rereading or highlighting. And so it can feel less effective whilst you're doing it, which can push you back to your old ways of doing things. But you know about this now, and so that won't happen to you, will it? Actually, this magic method works better as the difficulty increases. It's referred to as desirable difficulty, and the harder you have to work to retrieve the information, the better you'll remember and understand it. A single session of retrieval practice can generate memory improvements that persist for nine months, and the positive effects of retrieval over multiple sessions can last for at least eight years. There's a reason doing it over multiple sessions has an even more beneficial effect. It's called spaced practice, which handily is the name of technique number two. In a recent study, students in a math class were given 12 practice problems covering two topics to test whether it's more effective to learn intensively in a single session or over multiple sessions spaced out in time. One group tackled the problems in a day while the other spaced them out over three separate days, each a week apart. Four weeks later, both groups were tested on new problems from the same topics. So you might be wondering which approach proved superior. The space group outperformed the other group, but it was the margin of outperformance that was extraordinary. They scored twice as high. It's not surprising that the more you interact with a topic, the better you learn it. What is surprising is the timing of practice has a huge impact on learning outcomes. Learning sessions that are spaced out over time produce far better results than the same quantity of sessions over a shorter time period. This is known as the spacing effect. And like retrieval practice, it was first written about over a hundred years ago, and it is one of the most reliable and robust findings in the psychology of learning. The effects are seen over all age groups and at all levels of learning. 
It helps with memory retention and transfer of knowledge to new domains, and the effects are long-lasting. This paper from 2013 investigated 10 study strategies. The researchers found retrieval practice and distributed learning, which is another term for spaced practice, to be the most beneficial. You can see the effect from the chart. It also uncovered a fascinating finding. The longer you want to remember something, the greater the spacing interval should be. For example, to remember something for one week, learning episodes should be spaced 12 to 24 hours apart. To remember something for five years, the learning episodes should be spaced 6 to 12 months apart. This is all very interesting, but how does it help you? Spaced practice is a technique you can apply to your own learning immediately. And at the end of this video, I'll show you some splendid resources for learning how to do it. Combining it with retrieval practice makes it even more effective. And if you want to get really smart, you could schedule different topics within a session. That would definitely help because it's called interleaving and it's technique number three. Variety may be the spice of life, but it's also the secret to learning. So spice it up. What do I mean by that? Well, do not spend large amounts of time on one topic. Switch around. This is another one of those recommendations that sound counterintuitive, but it works. You might think I'm wrong, but I'm right, and I have science on my side. Like retrieval practice and spacing, um, can you tell me what they are? See what I did there? Interleaving is ridiculously effective. Students don't like it much, and neither do teachers. Just as you're starting to become familiar with the topic, it's whipped away and you're presented with something else. You wouldn't stand for it in a restaurant, you'd think the waiter had lost their mind. But you will be improving yours if you follow this strategy. I can see you're not convinced, so how about this? In what seems like an inhuman test, college students learning to calculate the volumes of unique geometric shapes were split into two groups. One group practiced problems categorized by shape type, achieving an 89% accuracy during practice. The second group tackled a mixed sequence of problems and achieved 60% accuracy. However, on a test a week later, the first group's accuracy dropped drastically to 20%, while the mixed sequence group improved to 63%. Another research experiment focused on associating paintings with their respective artists. Here, a popular hypothesis was that studying a single artist's oeuvre extensively, that's mass practice, before switching to another would be the optimal learning strategy. The underlying idea being that this focused approach would ingrain the unique characteristics of each artist's style. The interleaved approach, which mixes up artwork from different artists, was expected to confuse students. But the expectations were wrong. When it came to matching artworks to their creators at a later stage, the interleavers interleft the other group behind. They not only identified the previously seen artworks correctly, but also accurately associated new artworks with the artists unseen during the learning phase. Yet even after these results, students still saw mass practice as superior. But you won't do that, now that you know. Why would you do that? How would you do that? What would happen if you did that? Oh my, I've just accidentally introduced the next technique. Elaborative interrogation. Do you remember being a young child? I bet you asked a lot of questions. Why does it rain? Why is the sky blue? How do birds fly? Children are naturally curious and they never stop asking questions. They're building a mental model of the world, trying to make it make sense. It's extremely effective. Hold that thought, because I want to show you something. I want to show you this. It is an open access paper that covers all of these techniques, actually, plus a few others. It's called Teaching the Science of Learning, and I really recommend it. And it has a section on elaborative interrogation. It's as you're going through learning materials, you need to ask yourself questions. And as you ask yourself these how and why questions, you're fitting in the new knowledge into your existing knowledge network, which is a very effective way of learning. So this is a great place to start if you want to learn these techniques. There's a link in the description. Another free resource for learning all this stuff is learningscientists.org. That's a great website and it has lots of articles about all the various different methods that I've discussed in the video. If you're looking for an online paid course, then this one from Coursera is pretty good. I'd recommend that. And if it's a book you want, then this is the best one. Make it stick. And there's a link in the description. Imagine if there was a method of learning that made it all much easier that was free and fun. Well, there is, and it's the sponsor of this video, brilliant.org. 
It's the best way of learning math, science and computer science interactively. What do you want to learn? If you can think of a STEM subject, Brilliant probably has a lesson on it. They have thousands of them on data science, data analysis, AI, computer science, neural networks. They go from beginner to advanced and the content is matched to your expertise level by doing a quick quiz when you join up. Why is Brilliant so effective? Interactivity. Brilliant's platform is designed to make you think about what you're learning. Brilliant ensures you learn by doing, and there are always hints to help you out if you get stuck. Data skills are in high demand, and you can learn these with their new Data Analysis Fundamentals course, where you get to work on analyzing and drawing inferences from real data. With Brilliant, you can build a daily learning habit and future-proof yourself. Try it free for a full 30 days by going to brilliant.org forward slash Python programmer or just click on the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription.